So mutation can create genetic diversity by creating new alleles. And sexual reproduction can shuffle up those allele combinations, also giving you diversity. And then once you have genetic diversity, natural selection essentially sorts through that diversity, acts upon it to cause some alleles to uh, increase their frequency in a population over time and some alleles to decrease their frequency over time or sometimes become eliminated altogether. We can measure the impact of these traits um, using uh, what's called relative fitness, which is the contribution an individual makes to the gene pool of the next generation. If you have a lot of offspring, right, then you have had a uh, high contribution. Uh, if you've had small number of, of offspring, you've had a low contribution. But what's most important isn't the raw number of offspring, it's the number of offspring compared to everyone else um, in the population. So for a human, right, uh, if you have 10 kids, well, that's huge, right? But if you are a fruit fly, 10 offspring is very, very low. So uh, we're comparing uh, your contribution to the gene pool of the next generation to uh, everyone else in the population around you. And selection can act in a number of ways. Selection can push a trait in a particular direction, right? It can select for longer tails or shorter tails, or it can select for, um, you know, redder fur or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, or it may uh, select for some sort of middle ground, or it can select for the extremes at the expense of the middle ground, so essentially what we see is this. Um, so directional selection means you're pushing in a particular direction. So let's say we've got light and dark fur color. And if the environment has changed or you found a new environment where the background is darker, maybe you're on some darker rocks, right? Then the individuals who naturally have darker fur are going to, to do better. They're going to spread um, more alleles into the next generation because they have more offspring. And over the course of several generations, the average from the original population is going to move in this direction. And here's the average uh, color of the evolved population after several generations. Disruptive selection would be a situation where, you know, maybe it's patchy and you have light patches and dark patches. And, you know, you can stay safe if you're light or if you're dark, but if you're somewhere in the middle intermediate, there's no place for you to stay safe and you get picked off by hawks more easily. And so uh, you're disrupting um, that that uh, set of genes, right? And you're, you're pushing to both extremes, stabilizing the opposite, right? Maybe you find yourself in a habitat where it's primarily in the middle right? The, the background is, is moderate. And so if you are too light or too dark, uh, you're going to end up um, getting yourself eaten by a hawk. So as you might imagine, disruptive selection is going to be more likely to stimulate the production of new species, right? Um, if we have strong enough disruptive selection for a long enough time, uh, we may get so many light individuals and so many dark individuals, they may preferably mate with one another, because if you made across lines, you may get an individual in the middle or something like that, that that's less fit. Uh, and uh, you can create new species in that way. And across the billions of years of, of evolution by natural selection that we've seen on this planet, wild things have evolved. Um, certain octopuses can change color like that. They have these cells called chromatophores in their skin that can allow them to almost instantaneously change color for camouflage and also for communication. Um, snakes can literally unhinge their jaws so that they can eat prey that is larger than their head. Um, wild stuff. So as a result of natural selection, alleles that enhance survival and reproduction, um, reproduction specifically, survival really only as it leads to reproduction, uh, and those alleles then um, uh, you know, proliferate in the population and you wind up with organisms that are pretty well adapted to their environment. But environments are not static. Environments can change. And so adaptive evolution is a continuous process. It's always happening. We are still undergoing evolution by natural selection today. One example of natural selection that we kind of place into a different bucket because it has nothing to do with survival 
is sexual selection. Sexual selection is natural selection for mating success, right? So really, um, again, survival has nothing to do with anything except insofar as it allows you to have more offspring. And so if a trait doesn't increase your survival, but does increase your ability to attract mates and therefore have more offspring, it can be uh, beneficial. It can increase your relative fitness. And it results sometimes in sexual dimorphism, these differences that you see between the sexes in secondary sexual characteristics. You get situations like this where peacocks and peahens look very, very different from one another. Um, and peacocks have these wild tales, which I, I can't imagine a world in which that impacts survival positively, right? It makes it very difficult to walk around. It's a lot of extra stuff, it makes it easier for you to be seen, but it sure does attract the peahens. And so males with larger, uh, more elaborate, and also more symmetrical uh, tails um, are able to survive and reproduce more. Sorry, specifically reproduce more, not survive more. Sexual selection could involve uh, competition between individuals of the same sex, uh, usually for access to individuals of the opposite sex. So that's called intrasexual selection within your own sex. Most often, this is male-male competition. So when you think of uh, you know males fighting each other for territory and access to mates, this would be intrasexual selection. Intersexual selection is um, usually between the sexes, right? Intersexual means between the sexes, and that's often mate choice. And this occurs when individuals of one sex, uh, and usually this is females, uh, are very choosy. They select um, individuals of the opposite sex. So this can lead to showy males, right? Um, we just looked at the peacock, that's kind of an extreme example. But even, you know, things like cardinals, a lot of birds have very, very showy males and females that are a little bit plainer because the males have evolved to have wild physical characteristics, sometimes wild behavioral characteristics um, that allow them to uh, attract females, often because these things are proxies for some level of uh, genetic or developmental um, quality in males. Um, now, it's not always that females are the choosy sex and males are the showy sex. Uh, it's just uh, most common for some reasons that we'll talk about later. But in organisms where males have more investment in the offspring, uh, males are the choosy sex and females are the showy sex. So organisms like seahorses, right? Males carry the offspring um, when they're eggs and, and when they're young and therefore they have much more of an investment in these particular offspring. Um, and so they are very, very choosy about whose genes they combine with their own uh, in order to uh, produce those offspring. So I mentioned that oftentimes um, these preferences evolve because the traits in the showy males that, that, that attract females um, have some relationship to the quality of the genes in the male. So sometimes it has to do with, um, you know, the male's ability to um, to develop properly and symmetrically, and that that means that, that other parts of their physiology are probably well developed. Um, sometimes uh, it's there's a handicap hypothesis that says like, hey, if I have this big wild tail hanging off me and I'm still able to survive and reproduce. Ah, well, then I must be pretty fit and you want your offspring to have my genes. And there's a lot of experimental evidence for this kind of link between um, these traits and behaviors and good genes. So, for instance, um, if you look at um, some bullfrogs, right? So um, we have short call and long call males, and females tend to prefer males that have a longer call. Well, turns out the longer call males also, their larvae survive better, right? Um, they have shorter time to metamorphosis and become adults more quickly, which allows them to survive better and have more time to reproduce. So in this case, we have uh, evidence that females prefer those longer calls, but those longer calls may also be uh, representative of more successful offspring. So when you go sit on you know, your back porch this summer and you hear 
the frogs uh, going wild, pay attention to how long those calls are. When you get an extra long one, say, tip the cat, my friend. You probably have good genes. So if natural selection prefers one allele over another, for instance, uh, then why doesn't that other allele just end up dropping completely out of the population? And why don't we all just have uh, one allele for everything, right? Uh, well, there are a few reasons for that. One, the environments change, right? So, so selection doesn't always select for the same allele. Uh, but two, we are diploid organisms, which means we can maintain genetic variation in the form of recessive alleles that are not um, producing a trait at any point in time, unless you are homozygous for that recessive uh, trait. So recessive alleles can stick around in the population over time. But there are also examples of balancing selection, uh, which is a process by which natural selection is able to maintain stable frequencies of at least two phenotypes in a population. So there are two main examples, examples of these, heterozygote advantage and frequency dependent selection. In heterozygote advantage, um, exactly as the name suggests, heterozygotes are uh, favored uh, in natural selection over homozygotes of either one or the other allele. And this could be because we have some sort of incomplete dominance, right? So maybe pink flowers in our red and white allele uh, example uh, are the most fit, right? Maybe a particular pollinator prefers pink flowers for some reason. Uh, and because to have a pink flower, you need to have a red allele and a white allele. Um, both alleles are able to stick around in a population. And if both alleles are still in the population, you're still going to have homozygous uh, individuals of both kinds of alleles. They will just be at a competitive disadvantage when they pop up. Another example of heterozygote advantage is um, sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a recessive trait, right? You need two of the recessive alleles to have sickle cell disease. Um, if you are um, heterozygous, you don't have sickle cell disease. You do have sickle trait, which can cause some negative effects, but you can live with it. And having that, um, that sickle cell allele also confers malaria resistance. And malaria is a huge killer in the world, so being resistant to malaria is a significant selective advantage. And so in regions where malaria is common, um, you tend to find more prevalence of the sickle cell allele. Now, this was discovered by a doctor who uh, was studying in Kenya, and he realized that sickle cell anemia was way more common in the lowlands than it was up in the plateau where there are far fewer mosquitoes and therefore far less malaria. And he put two and two together and then did a couple of studies and figured out this case of heterozygote advantage. Another example um, of balancing selection is frequency dependent selection. So this is where one phenotype may have an advantage and therefore the allele that codes for that phenotype has an advantage for a while. But when that phenotype becomes too common, then a different phenotype gains an advantage. Um, so that may be confusing, but an example of this is uh, right-mouthed and left-mouthed scale-eating fish. So these scale-eating fish eat scales, and this is a left-mouthed individual, and this is a right-mouthed individual. Left-mouthed individuals sneak up from the right side, and because we run from their mouth is on the left, they can boom really quickly grab um, scales off the right side. Right-mouthed ones can grab them quickly off of the left side of a fish. Now, over time across generations, these fish learn to protect themselves from the side where they get attacked the most. And so if you have a lot of left-mouthed fish, it becomes uh, beneficial to be a right-mouthed fish, which is a different allele. Then the right-mouthed fish allele expands the population, so does this phenotype. And then over time, the fish become more protective of their left sides and it becomes more beneficial for you to be a left mouth fish, thereby you bouncing between um, uh, more prevalence of each allele uh, and maintaining both alleles and both phenotypes in the population. Also, keep in mind that while natural selection can uh, help a population of organisms become more adapted to their environment and more fit in their environment, it does not necessarily fashion perfect organisms for these reasons that you see here and in your book.